Which picture do you find more attractive, left or right? The difference is minimal, but most people would consider the woman on the right to be more attractive. But why? Hi, my name is Felix and my channel is about the psychology of innovation. Therefore, this video is also not about the attractiveness of people, but about the difference between ordinary companies and real innovators, companies that actually change the world. One evening in the 1960s, Eckhart Hess, a professor and researcher at the University of Chicago, was looking at beautiful animal photographs in his bedroom. Suddenly, his wife noticed that his pupils were dilated. This surprised Professor Hess because the bedroom was brightly lit and pupils usually tend to dilate in the dark. The next day, he immediately conducted a small experiment with a male colleague at his institute. He took a few pictures of rather boring landscape photographs and mixed in randomly a picture of a Zema nude pinup girl. Yes, having been a researcher in the 1960s sounds like fun. Anyway, he held the pictures above his head so he couldn't see them himself and watched his colleague's pupils closely. And bang! When he showed the seventh picture, he noticed a significant enlargement of the colleague's pupils. And of course, it was the pinup picture. Many literati have claimed for hundreds of years that there is something magical about eyes. Yes, people even said that they are the window to the soul. But scientifically, the subject was not investigated until then. But since that day, Professor Hess never let go of the subject. Since his small first test with the pinup girl, he made dozens of experiments in which other influencing factors, above all the brightness of the room, were eliminated. His finding? In the case of interest and excitement, pupils dilate, in fact, often up to 30%. With boredom and disinterest, however, they remain the same. And with disgust, they even shrink. You remember the picture at the beginning? The woman on the right has artificially enlarged pupils, while the left shows obviously the same woman with reduced pupils. The right image seems more attractive, especially to men, because we men subconsciously fear that the woman is interested in us. But it is not only arousal due to attractiveness that shows up in dilated pupils, but any kind of arousal. For example, the image of a baby also triggers strong arousal, but only to the female subjects of the study. The pupils of the male participants did not change at the sight of a cute baby. However, when the participants of the same study were shown a picture of a shark, the pupils of the male participants dilated significantly in size. Yes, sharks, baby. Holy shit. And the pupils of the female subjects actually got smaller. But an intellectual challenge also can be attractive and trigger arousal. For example, puzzles and math problems also cause the pupils to enlarge, especially when one is about to solve the problem. Whether the eyes are a window to the soul is difficult to prove. But anatomically, the eyes are an extension of the brain. Therefore, they are probably the best way to assess another person's brain without the use of brain scanners. Excitement is what most people miss in their work. Many people try to replace the lack of excitement and motivation at work with distraction. The little flirt at a copy machine? A desperate attempt to make the work a bit less dull. A friend of mine, Rafa Elaitoritz, who worked at Google for many years as a product manager for Google Maps and other Google services, once told me, what Google is all about is being in love with hard problems. Being in love with hard problems is a great phrase that has stuck with me ever since. After all, what is typically done to create a so-called culture of innovation? Many companies prefer to copy the look and feel of Google. They make everything colorful, open and playful. There's nothing wrong with making offices more open and colorful. Put a slide in my office and I never take the elevator again, Benjamin Franklin famously said. But all these gimmicks don't enable radical innovation. What makes the culture at Google special is falling in love with hard problems. So I called Raphael and asked him if he could give me a good example of a really hard problem they had to solve at Google Maps. One of the really hard problems was the real-time search for the best public transport connection that we take for granted today. Right, so everybody knows I can drive from A to B on Google Maps by a car, um, but this is about you know taking the train, taking the bus, and all. And um, so I was. This was actually my first job at Google 15 years ago. To say 
let's make this as good as cars. But uh, there's a fundamental difference with cars, which is cars under normal circumstances, relatively easy to route from A to B because you have highways, which are very fast. You have some sort of normal cross, you know, country roads, and then you have local roads, right, or even city roads. But basically, you know, if you go far, you go on a fast uh, road. If you are close, you go through a local road. It's very easy to prioritize and have a higher hierarchy of those. On Google Transit or public transportation, it's very different. There is no such hierarchy. There are trains that bring you far. But for example, if you miss one bus, that one single bus connection between, let's say, two, I don't know, stations, you miss this bus, you might completely shift your schedule by an hour. Or if one train is delayed, everything else doesn't matter anymore, right? Because you basically have interdependencies between every single step of, of the journey. And every step of the journey is really critical to the end result. So it's a lot of calculations you need to do, like computer science calculations, to optimize them. So what, what our end goal with Google Transit was that we, you know, you were like with cars, you basically produce any result in a microsecond, in a millisecond on, on Google Maps, right? But with public transportation, when we did the same thing with the existing algorithm, this could have taken sometimes half a, half a minute, right? Or 20 seconds if you recalculate, because you have to recalculate everything, the whole you know, set of options. So we thought this is impossible, but we said, you know what, that's an interesting challenge, let's try. The way we all went about it is we said, you know, okay, this is this is our 10x, this is not 10%, let's do it, let's try it. And then we set it up basically as space research. We had a cooperation with, a, with one of the leading scientists in that space who thinks in those hierarchies for public transportation. We actually brought her into the team um, for about half a year. And the interesting journey for me as product manager was I I didn't I didn't understand what they were doing. Like I'm a computer scientist, but I couldn't watch the results. For the longest time, I did not know whether they're succeeding or not. And even they did not know. So so there's something kind of about this groundbreaking things where it's very hard to know, oh tomorrow I will succeed or not. Right? It's hard to see the progress. Because it's about fundamental problems, right? Does the rocket land or not? Can I calculate this in real time or not, right? And you don't know until you know. And really, it needed a lot of patience and goodwill. And in the end, sort of, maybe not surprising, but, you know, I had lost a little bit of hope. They actually succeeded. And then it clicked. And they sort of said, okay, we now found an approach, right? And it was sort of the base research succeeded. And at that point, it flipped from a, let's say, we don't know problem to a, yes, we've solved it and now it's about optimizing. But then the optimization was just a matter of, you know, again, patience and resources, but we knew basically. Being in love with hard problems arouses people, but not only that, being in love with hard problems has a whole range of benefits as Raphael elaborates. So first of all, I think if you really know it's a hard problem and not just 10% better than maybe what you've done last year, one advantage is you really rethink the problem, right? You really rethink the approach and you maybe come to very, very different approaches because you say, you know what? Yeah, what brought me here won't get me there. I need to, you know, crack the nut in a different way. And I think this is very liberating and many, many big ideas, you know, or big solutions have been, you know, solved that way that you say, aha, what if I think about that? So that's the first argument. I think the second one is about people and kind of motivations of folks. I think there's a class of people that really like to work on tough stuff and you know be challenged in a healthy way and then there's the third one which is also maybe a bit counterintuitive i think you actually have less competition if you work on tough stuff and i think there is a trap of 10 percent better versus 10x better and you know many many companies just think 10 percent better like the year after year like i just go 10 percent but if you do 10x at least aim for 10x you don't have those companies. But how do you solve these really hard problems? One of the best ways is to think in terms of first principles. I made a whole video on this topic explaining how thinking in first principles works. You can watch it here. If you're interested in the topic of the psychology of innovation, feel free to subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell so you will be notified whenever I upload a new video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. So we'll say no to love. We'll say no to love.